So Cantor Fitzgerald, in, in you know, they did that heavy review for almost two years of uh, all our finances. So that's how Howard Lapnick, the CEO of Cantor, was comfortable enough to say four words: they have the money. Yeah, and um, that I think shocked many people in Wall Street in, in the in the financial markets. This content is brought to you by BitGo, which is one of the top crypto custodians in the crypto industry. BitGo works with many big companies and brands, such as Pantera Capital, Bitstamp, and Bitcoin IRA. Nike also selected BitGo to power its wallets for its NFTs. And BitGo has many great services, such as hot wallets, custodial wallets, self-managed cold wallets, and NFT wallets. Many institutions trust BitGo with its top-level security and incredible services, such as being able to deploy your capital while it's in custody, which includes lending, borrowing, trading, staking, DeFi access, and more. If you'd like to learn more about BitGo, please visit bitgo.com, link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Paolo Arduino, who's the CEO of Tether and the CTO at Bitfinex. Paolo, great to have you on. Thank you very much for having me, Tony. Paolo, I'm, I'm super excited to speak with you. I'm ecstatic because I'm a user of USDT and I've followed Tether for a long time. Uh, you guys are, of course, the largest stable coin in the entire world. So I got lots of questions for you, but let's start with your background. Uh, where are you from and what's your professional background? Well, as you can hear from my accent, I'm Italian. I grew up in a small town in Italy and then... Um, been, I've been a software developer for all, almost all my life. I started coding at the age of eight, and then um, you know I didn't, I didn't have much much to do, you know, because the town was super small. In my classroom at the um, at school, we were like four or five kids, mm -hmm. and uh, everyone was living scattered on the territory. So you know, my my one one day, my father came home with. Uh, 286, uh, one of the first x86 computers, personal computers. I was, and uh, you know, I, I started trying to understand what I could do with that, and started playing with it. And uh, I, I really do consider um, coding as, as a form of art, right? I was really terrible in, in in drawing and doing almost anything that was related to art. But then I, I found my way in creating, you know, my own universes uh, through computer programming. And then that's why I really, really love it. And um, so I went to the university in Genoa, then in the um, northwest side of Italy, uh, studied math applied to computer science. And then I graduated there, I worked as a couple of years uh, as a researcher on a a really, couple of really cool projects. Then, as many times happen in uh, in Italy, you don't get paid much. Actually, you know the mm -hmm. the average pay is quite quite low. So I decided to to look around and uh, start learning. I started learning finance, and I got a job as a developer um, as a, a lead developer for um, a portfolio management system for a hedge fund. And then I understood I could grow that and I could improve, um, you know, our, I wanted to try to improve the financial system, uh, infrastructure and technology. And so I created my own startup in, in London in, in 2011-12. Um, but something happened in 2013. I got to know Bitcoin. Mm. I started to be to going down the rabbit hole of, of, uh, of Bitcoin. And um, 2014, I, I got the chance of uh, knowing Giancarlo De Vazzini, uh, Tether, and uh, Bitfinex CFO. Um, I was hired to work on the Bitfinex machine engine uh, back then. Uh, the platform was growing fast. Um, he had more users, had margin trading, was quite unique. Uh, as an offering back in 2014, but it suffered in terms of scalability. 
um, on the machine engine side. So I started working on it and, and improving weekly or monthly in order to, you know, when I joined, it was able to cope with 50 orders per second. Nowadays, it can cope with uh, 1 million orders per second. Mm -hmm. So um, big, 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 big scale. And um, the I always I always got excited about building software solutions and building products that would be resistant to the wrath of God or to an ap apocalypse. Right? That is, I'm a big sci-fi fan. Um, you know, with uh, you know, a biggest fan of uh, the the, the psychological foundation of uh, Asimov, iRobot, and and all that thing, but not not just Asimov. The entire sci-fi world is is my world, and so I always think how you can build things that uh, are built for the worst rather than for for the good times. I believe that uh, unfortunately humanity is always finding ways to go towards a worse scenario rather than the best scenario, especially you know every few decades right. we are not able to to live in peace. So I think that technology should be built for for those to, to be resilient and to keep working even the worst case scenarios. Mm. Now, speaking of sci-fi, I'm a sci-fi fan as well. And I often think about the world we're heading in, very digital. Uh, you have AI, robotics, but of course, blockchains and the ability to have digital money that settles instantly. And I see like Tether as a staple coin being uh, USDT being a part of that. So w w this is a tough question, but what's your time horizon for when we go fully immersed into that digital world where I'm not carrying around cash or a credit card, but it's my cell phone or a digital ID I have on my watch that I, I can pay with. And it's using things like maybe stable coins that settle instantly. So I think we're going in, in five years, the world of um, payments will be completely different than um, what is today. Today, we are already on the right track of uh, changing the shape of uh, of payments, but mm -hmm. the full realization will happen in the next five years, right? Right now, we, we are still, although we're still early, although Tether, we count for around 300 million users across the globe, uh, we have still a lot of, um, of work to do in order to make it easier to access uh, stablecoin services. Mm. Today, stablecoin services are making the life of hundreds of millions of, of people easier. They are making, they are allowing them to hold their money in their uh, phone. And that's great. Keep in mind that there are billions of people in the world that don't have a bank account. They are unbanked. And not because they are bad people, they are great people, um, you know, simple people, but just they are too poor to be of interest of the banking system. Right. And so for those billions of people, stable coins are um, a life vest. And that's the realization that we had in the last years. Tether, when it was born, was a crypto trading settlement system. I wish I could tell you that, you know, we were so forward look, uh, forward thinking that we thought in 2014 when Tether was created, that Tether would become this behemoth and would revolutionize the payment system, the trade file system, and, uh, and uh, you know, being, will be, would become in, in 10 years the checking account of hundreds of millions of people. Right. We we didn't envision that. We we are simple people. We our our imagination was limited at that time, right? But the reality is that with the pandemic and with the effects of the pandemic of on um, the economies of many many countries around the world crashing, that they started you know with this uh, spiral, a downward spiral of that started to crash. Um, their national um, economies and so their national currencies, many countries think of Argentina and Turkey and many others, mm. these current national currencies started to go down the bin. And so USDT became the, 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 the life vest of, uh, of uh, these hundreds of millions of people. But this is just beginning. I think in the next five to 10 years, imagine robots, you mentioned robots and AI, 
do you think that the robots and AI will send wires? I mean, robots and AI will be a, will be a complementary part of our lives. They will, they will, hopefully they will not kill all of us, uh, but um, we will find a way to, to work and, and live with them. But they will need to have access. They will want, they will design real-time payment systems that will leverage stable coins and Bitcoin and peer-to-peer -peer payment networks because there is no other way to, in order for them to function otherwise. So, the, and there is no other way around. It would be presumptuous for, for us and for humanity to think that machines that will act faster, will think in, in nanoseconds, will just abide to our outdated since the 40, 50 years financial system. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on that note, aside from Bitcoin, are stable coins the killer app of blockchain? You know, given that uh, it solves a big problem that we have with money. Um, it, Like you said, it helps people to become banked, those who the large banks and so forth ignore. Um, and we have instant settlement, real time, uh, verifiable, is stable coins the killer app? Uh, once again, aside from Bitcoin as as a store of value, the short answer is yes. I mean, as of today, I don't think um, dog coins are a killer app. <laughs> although there is a lot of hype, yeah. um, I think that uh, I you know I started in Bitfinex in two thousand fourteen. I saw the two thousand seventeen ICO boom. Yeah, I, I think. We have too many tokens, we have too many products on chain. I mean, um, some are interesting, but the vast majority are not and are extremely problematic for the legitimacy of, uh, of the actual blockchain use. What I like about blockchains is that they provide the first, for the first time in human history, a global consensus system, right? So the way we use it could be, uh, could be immense. Right. You can use it for, for transparency, as we, we are using it for, for Bitcoin and stablecoins. But we have to, um, I think when I think the, the, the way blockchains are being used today is only probably 1% of their potential. So I see we, we still need to see DHL and all the other you know, distribution providers how um, they can leverage blockchain to have a more um, efficient and and, uh, and transparent tracking system. You can put many things in blockchain, of, although you cannot put everything on blockchain. Also, you know, one thing you can do many things on the other thing, we should not fall in the mistake that uh, blockchain is the holy grail of, uh, of all problems of humanity, right? So also blockchains are extremely slow. Even the fastest blockchains are terribly slow compared to the needs of humanity. So right. yeah, I think stable coins proved to be the first mass adoption application of blockchains. And on top of it, and on top of black block, uh, on top of stable coins and top of blockchain, you can build, you can use stable coins as a building blocks for many other opportunities that finally tap in the real world. We are seeing like GameFi, so the ability of using blockchain and stablecoins in order to settle in-game economies, that is going to be huge, right? Games and esports are growing, so that is another incredible opportunity. But again, has to be tackled in in a way that focuses on on uh, the real needs of gamers and and mass adoption rather than just creating multiple tokens um, for for just for the hype. Now you mentioned, you know, some blockchains are still very slow. So do you see that as things progress and we have further iteration of the technology, there will be faster, more efficient blockchains? Could we align it from a parallel standpoint to the early 90s of Web 1.0? Very slow, dial up, right? A lot of friction for consumers. But maybe five years from now, we have more better blockchains. What, what do you think about that? Well, this is a tricky one because there is a there is a limit in that in physics called speed of light. Mm -hmm. So the current fastest blockchain today is Solana. Um, they have a four hundred milliseconds block time, and uh, four hundred milliseconds is not much if you think about it. But 
is is a lot, but it's not even much, right? So it's not much because uh, it's probably the lowest you can go because if you have a node that is in Tokyo and one that is in New York and one that is in London, the speed of light still takes, and so fiber optics still take hundreds of milliseconds uh, mm. to, to pass the signal, the data, uh, around the Earth. So if you need to do multiple hops and you need to reach a consensus, you will still need few hundred milliseconds in order to to achieve um, this global consensus. So what I think will happen is that I, I don't think Bitcoin is low and the Bitcoin block time is, is 10 minutes. Let's think about why Bitcoin block time is so slow, right? If, uh, if you have, if suddenly there is a word unrest with a big war, for example, fast blockchains will die because the problem is that internet lines will be so attacked and will be less resilient and less and less stable, so that the the retransmission necessity and uh, of uh, of uh, of internet will keep retransmitting sp uh, packets, and so will make the fastest blockchains unusable. So they will maybe hard fork or will have many, many problems. Now, the the beauty of Bitcoin is that when the block the, the block size is uh, you know one megabyte to one two megabytes pretty much. And the block time is 10 minutes. So wherever you are, even if you are in the most remote part of the world, now you can download the Bitcoin blockchain and participate to the Bitcoin blockchain through a satellite. So how cool is that, right? So you can have, you can, you can, everyone, almost everyone, even in, in, in the most remote regions of the world and the poorest regions of the world, people can download one megabyte in 10 minutes with a reasonable cost. So you is about inclusivity mm. and that is extremely important. And, and the blockchains, in my opinion, there is no way to scale a blockchain to tens of millions of transactions per second. So if you really want to put all AI, all the microtransactions of humanity and robots and AI for, and uh, all the necessity fridges that are going to buy milk if you are you know, not have enough milk in your fridge, light bulbs that will buy and pay will for their small electricity bill themselves, right? Imagine a real world that is built on IoT. Imagine the everything is connected to the internet. Then you are talking about tens of millions of transactions per second, you know, speed of light and, and uh, is going to be a big issue. And especially because you have to reach this huge consensus. But the reality, and let's think, do I care to see your light bulb buying electricity on chain? Do I care to see that transaction? No, I don't. The way it should work is the way Lightning Network is, at least ideally, is built. Mm. So Lightning Network has still many limitations, but the point of Lightning Network Leave aside the fact that it still needs a lot of work because it has to improve and is not that efficient today. Lightning Network is built to be peer-to-peer -peer so that you open a channel only with the person or the entity that you want to interact with. You open a channel between two devices, two nodes, and so these nodes will interact with each other. They will have their you know, consensus system that can then escalate and settle Bitcoin. So that... Everyone, ideally, still we are talking about the ideal world, everyone can have a channel with another person and can scale to infinity. There are st still some constraints, but I believe that is the right track, that is the right path, where you have a really slow monetary base, monetary system, that is Bitcoin, that can settle everything. And on top of it, you could have USDT channels USDT peer-to-peer payment channels that are between only the parties that are interested. So that's that's how I think. And and the thing, you know, the, the thing about technology is not that is, is that uh, is not subjective. Hmm. It's like math technology, right? So right. is should be objective because 
what I'm describing is the only way to do it and is the only objective way to do it, then you, you know, of course, there are people that would disagree with me, but I think that math and physics are, are something that should be fairly objective. And what I'm describing is, is a physics system and the only one that can scale. Then, you know, you can build those lower systems and that have many trade-offs. But if you really want to be futuristic and think to the next 20, 30 years, that's the only way. Mm. Um, yeah, great, great thoughts there. Now, uh, Paolo, USDT, Tether, of course, largest stable coin in the world, but there are competitors popping up. You have USDC being issued by Circle. PayPal launched their own stable coin. How are you and the folks at Tether looking at your expansion and continued growth and uh, you know, staying ahead of the competitors, essentially. So I think we are going, Tether is going towards a completely different, is going in a completely different direction compared to our competition. Mm. So I feel like comp our competition feels that uh, stable coins are the, the goal of their journey. For mm. us, stable coins were the beginning of our journey. Mm. So USDT is one of the greatest products that we created and is our current main product. We have we have other products. We we like to think ahead of the curve, ahead of time. So as we said, and as, as I said before, um you know, humanity might not be going towards, you know, a nicer time. And so for that, for example, we created another stable coin called XLT, that is Tether Gold. Mm. Um, the beauty of Tether Gold, I feel, is, you know, uh, with a little bit of history, right? So we know we know that uh, from, from recent statistics that um, the US dollar is being printed at a pace of uh, 1 trillion every 100 days. Mm -hmm. And let's think about that the US dollar is still the best fiat currency out there because US dollar is, is better than the other fiat currencies. It doesn't have to be perfect, right, to be beating the other fiat currencies. It has to be nicer, prettier than the other fiat currencies. If you look at Europe, right, Outside of Europe, no one wants the euro. Not even Europeans probably want the euro, right? So we, until 20 years ago, every European country had its own currency. And now, you know, everyone is upset. I mean, especially being Italian, we thought that, uh, or we started to understand that we had, we were, sorry for the term, fucked by, <laughs> by, by the euro <laughs> and in the conversion rate and for many other reasons. So no one's. I believe wanted the euro, but that is, and the euro is probably among the top five best currency in the world. So imagine all the others. So if there is something that is true in the history of humanity, is that 2000 years ago, uh, Cicero was writing that, you know, in the Roman times, was writing that with one ounce of gold, you could buy a fine vest and a nice pair of sandals. Today, with $2,000, you know, one ounce of gold, you can buy a fine suit and a nice pair of shoes. Mm. When the Fed was created in 1913, the ratio between an ounce of gold and a barrel of oil um, was um, uh, 27 to 1. Same thing if fast forward, you know, 100 years today is the same. So it's actually, so there are things that never change in ratio. And uh, so the fiat currency is inevitably going down the bin. Yeah. So that's that's what we want to explain. That's what we believe is that gold has been historically for for thousands of years the the way for for humanity to to go through financial resets. Today we have bitcoin and a big, I'm a personally a big believer in Bitcoin being superior to gold mm -hmm. from a technological standpoint, of course, the transportability and ma many, many other reasons. But there are many people still in this world that think that gold is more valuable mm -hmm. and uh, is more is safer than Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. 
just because they need their time to understand it, right? especially with um, higher age, there is, uh, you know, gold, gold is more understood than Bitcoin. And so the ability of making gold more transportable is really important. So what we do, we, what we did with XLT was to tokenize gold. So XLT holds 100% of gold in vaults physically in Switzerland. So now we can tokenize the gold and it can be moved on blockchain, it can be used as collateral on smart contracts and so on, and can be used for payments. And we have some really cool projects around it. But that is an example of us thinking ahead and thinking, okay, and trying to look at where the world is going and how we can preempt or create something around it. But also, that's another stable coin. But Tether now, also thanks to its enormous profitability, um, we, we started thinking how or where we should be going as a company. And first of all, we have been we are extremely thankful for this industry and for Bitcoin as uh, uh, the creator of this industry. And um, we we are also big believers in the philosophy of Bitcoin in terms of openness, transparency, and the ability of creating sovereign individuals. Mm -hmm. The one of the cool things about Bitcoin is that you you can. Um, if you have financial freedom, means that you have your phone with a wallet, you can spend your Bitcoins with whomever. Mm. But that is just a part of it, because in order to really be free, you need also freedom of speech. So in the last few years, actually five years ago, we started working on a project and we co-founded a project called Hole Punch. Mm. Um, that uh, is um, a peer-to-peer -peer communication system to bring the same philosophy of Bitcoin. It's like BitTorrent for communications, for real-time communication instead only for file sharing. Mm. It has the same resiliency of, of BitTorrent and Bitcoin in terms of Bitcoin, of course, uh, if you transpose the, the financial part into the communication part. So it is the unstoppable communication system it's free of charge, no, no, no blockchain, no, no token. It's just a set of protocols that we use and we build in order to allow every single developer to build unstoppable applications. Mm -hmm. So, again, thinking about the same philosophy, you see that the same philosophy keeps keep supplying. If the world is going towards a, or is going in a bad place, how we can make sure that people are not stuck with WhatsApp and Google Meet or Zoom that are owned by a single country and they, the data centers are present in just few countries. Mm. If uh, the world is going towards a worse place, you can imagine people's private, people, private people's data being used against people in other countries. Right now, I'm Italian. Imagine you were living in Rome um, if you send a message to one of your family members, you know, 90% of the people are much more likely to talk to people will living in the same area within two kilometers to 10 kilometers from where they live. Right. So, so now if you are in Rome, you, you use WhatsApp, your message will go every single time you've messaged someone on WhatsApp, your message will go from Rome to Frankfurt and back to Rome. Right? How crazy is that? How much? Imagine how much people and gov governments are spending in, in in improving the internet infrastructure when probably ninety percent of the traffic is deemed to remain in the same area. How much crazy? How crazy is that? Mm -hmm. Because we could we could have less powerful internet lines and still still have an incredible user experience just because. We don't have to send all that immense amount of data, you know, back and forth for thousands and thousands of miles or kilometers uh, just to get back a um, few hundred meters or a few kilometers from you. So with uh, with Hole Punch and Kit, that is the first peer-to-peer -peer chat app that we built, we are demonstrating that. You can have an amazing user experience. You can build applications that can resist to the wrath of God and can resist in apocalypse scenario. And... That's again tether. How we we experience with stable coins, how powerful new technology can be, 
and we invested in the same in, in with the same philosophy in a different field. We recently announced our investments in Bitcoin mining and energy um, production. So again, you can see Bitcoin is, is mining is extremely centralized in, in, in North America now. We wanted to create different opportunities across South America, Central America and other parts of the world to decentralize Bitcoin mining because we believe that Bitcoin has to be protected and it has to be helped to remain decentralized. Mm. We announced recently Tether Education, that is our, it's not just a blockchain education, it's an education initiative that invests in EduTech software to create peer-to-peer -peer education systems so that education cannot be stopped anymore. So our motto now became recently unstoppable together. So how we can build and how we can leverage technology to create unstoppable movements of education, of energy production, Bitcoin mining, uh, communication, and uh, and uh, and uh, financial freedom. Mm. I love it. Um, and a lot of great initiatives that you guys are working on. Now, with Tether and USDT being the top stable coin in the world, the king of the hill, you know, everybody comes and takes shots at the king, right? Um, and you got people who are trying to short Bitcoin, so they put foot out there. There's been uh, talks about Tether not having its res reserves or it's using Chinese commercial paper and all these different things. How would you like to address, um, you know, those FUD items? And, and once again, these have been around for years uh, since I've been here and since 2016. Hi, everyone. Pardon the interruption. I'm Tony Edward, the founder and host of the Thinking Crypto podcast. I have a huge favor to ask you. If you haven't subscribed as yet on YouTube or the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the notification bell on the YouTube platform and on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast. It allows me to bring great quality content to you. Thank you for your support. And I'll let you get back to the content. Yeah. So first of all, I think the, you know, especially recently, you hear that less and less for multiple reasons, right? So first of all, I like always to start from a kind of mea culpa. Um, means that Tether should have been more open in uh, in the past years. Well, after before 2022, mm. we 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 were fairly naive. We had you know we we thought that keeping our head down, having a great product, doing good work would be enough for people to finally understand that we are good guys. But it's also true, and you know before 2022, we didn't even have a marketing team. Mm. Now we have a great marketing team. We have you know great communication team. We we improved ourselves because we understood that we were really really naive. So um, the reality though is that you know in, imagine a, ro a room full of people in 2020. You know all the greatest people of the crypto industry. You know all chatting among themselves and looking at us. Right in that room. There will there were there was also us tether and in that room they were all chatting and whispering and looking at us like the looking at the black sheep of the crypto industry mm. they were whispering to each other saying oh tether is going down of course you know they don't have the money they are look at those you know weird italian guys right for sure they, they are you know um shady then a few years later, 2023, 2024, in that room, you hear silence hmm. because not because there, you know, because people are may necessarily <laughs> think better of us. I think many are actually, but in that room, there is almost no one remaining hmm. because all the mighty heroes of the crypto industry were the actual people that were the thing were doing the things that they accuse us, uh, accused us of. Hmm. Let's remember the Celsius, the BlockFi, the yeah. FTX, um, you know, recently DCG, uh, Genesis, and all these guys. And it's kind of sad because, you know, that created a lot of FUD. In a way, it helped Tether. I believe that it helped Tether. It helped us to be stronger, to become resilient, to become, to, to be even more aggressive in be willing to show to the world who we are for real. Mm. In 2022, you said, you know, people were shorting Bitcoin, but actually they were shorting. There were many groups that were shorting USDT. Mm. 
to cause a potential bank run. After Terra Luna, after Terra Luna blew up, oh, yeah. many, many groups were shorting um, USDT below the dollar to mm. cause this bank run. So when that happens, you, it means that uh, if uh, many, many people, billions of dollars are sold below one dollar, market makers would rush in to buy this cheap USDT, go to Tether, redeem them for one dollar and back and back and forth so that you can um so that um, there is a lot of redemptions right because you have tether has to pay out all this this money mm -hmm. so what happens that back then in may is that was that um, tether was able to pay seven billion dollars in 48 hours so two days wow. that was 10 percent of our reserves and more than 20 billion dollars in 20 days that was 25 percent of our reserves mm -hmm. now let's think about the banking industry you know, uh, Washington Mutual in 2008, but or more recently Silicon Valley Bank, all never s survived to a 10% bank run. Why? Mm -hmm. Because banks can lend up to 90% of the balance sheet, and you know they can they lend it all. And the rest probably the, so as happened recently, it was discovered that was invested in municipality bond with really long maturity. Mm -hmm. So you have to start thinking who is the actual company that takes more good care of risk management and care about its users. So Tether, since uh, two, three years, have enjoyed the interest rates, the higher interest rates on, um, on the US T-bills. Right now, Tether holds, well, at the last attestation, 31st of December, 2023, Tether held 80.3 billion in US T-bills. Wow. That puts Tether, I think, just behind Germany. Mm -hmm. If you think about China in the last three years, sold three years ago, they had like three, two trillion dollars in USD bills. Now they have around the 800 um, billion. It means that Tether holds around 10% of what China holds in, in terms of um, US debt. So we are actually grew up, we are in a situation where Every single person, imagine a person in Argentina that is buying USDT, we take the, the dollars and we invest and we purchase a piece of the US debt. So we created many innovations. People think about the stable coin as a single innovation, but um, we, we created this new innovation of being able to purchase you know, foreign debt. We are able to... Um, so when people use USDT, they have the... They, they get also to empower the US dollar in terms of global dominance. Right. And um, and also, we all announced in the last um, few attestations, in the last few quarters, how Tether keeps the vast majority of the profits within the company uh, reserves. Mm -hmm. So right now in the last attestation, we had around $5.2 billion in excess equity. Mm -hmm. So Tether is profitable, as I said, and the vast majority of the companies would have happily distributed those profits among shareholders. Yeah. We decided to keep the vast majority in the company, the vast, vast majority in the company, because we want to demonstrate that who believes in the future of finance and the revolution of finance should also act in a much more responsible way, ensuring that whatever happens, we can show that Tether doesn't only have 100% of uh, liquid assets as reserves, but in this moment has around 105%. Mm -hmm. So we want to showcase that a different type of finance is possible. So this is my answer to all the criticism and uh, all the, I, I think nowadays only few people are still wondering if we have the money. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, the FUD has died down a lot. And, you know, recently, uh, earlier this year, I should say, at Davos, Cantor Fitzgerald uh, CEO Howard Lutnick gave a great endorsement of Tether, uh, saying that they have reviewed uh, your books and all these things. How are you working with Cantor Fitz Fitzgerald and are you working with other Wall Street type firms as well? So Cantor Fitzgerald and, and you know, they did then heavy review for almost two years of uh, all our finances. So that's how Howard Lapnick, the CEO at Cantor, was comfortable enough to say four words. They have the money. Yeah. 
And um, that, I think, shocked many people in Wall Street in, in, the, in the financial markets because Howard Latinik is a person that of high respect, high integrity, and uh, Cantor Fitzgerald is, is uh, one of the few, I think there are only 24 primary dealers that are connected to the Fed and, um, mm. and work directly with the Fed. Now, the, the uh, ability to work with the Cantor is extremely important for Tether because it gives to Tether the access to overnight reverse repos that allow Tether to use to have access to tens of billions of dollars in liquidity just overnight. So no matter how many redemptions we get, we can always pay out in, in the blink of an eye. Mm. Now, with that said, and this is a rookie question I'm asking you here because I, I, I'm generally curious, you have the reserves, you have the attestations and all these things. Are there other uh, concerns that things that may happen that unforeseen or whatever it may be that could cause a deep pegging. Um, or do you think you guys have all your T's crossed, your, your I's dotted and so forth? So it would be presumptuous thinking and saying that, um, you know, uh, um, it, we are never looking to improve uh, um, our resiliency. I think a company like us, should be aware of uh, the world that is uh, changing. We should be aware of uh, the the risks uh, around um, the uh, macroeconomical situation mm -hmm. uh, in the world. So the the good thing about us is that we are extremely paranoid. So we are paranoid. We want. We are extremely conservative. Mm -hmm. We we took. You know, when in 2022, all all those crypto companies went bust because they were lending to each, each other based on a pinky swear yeah. and um, out of thin air created collateral. Now, there is a, you know, we, we didn't end up, we never enter in that, uh, in those type of uh, bad deals just because we understand that, that Look, the the thing that we really do care about is that we are simple, humble, but extremely responsible people. We think that we know that our product is used by hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. And we are going to do the best to everything that we can to make sure that we are not hurting those people because those are not the riches, right? Those are not the rich people in the world. Those are the people that live in emerging markets. And so we don't, for sure, our priority is not let them down. Mm. Um, definitely, there, there is a lot to learn. There will be always a talk towards that, right? As you said, everyone will try to stop the king. Yeah. And so we are expecting that. We are expecting that every single day of our lives. Yeah. Right. And this only, but this only gives us the motiv motivation to do better to always improve our resiliency, to improve the company, to always finding, you know, different angles on how, you know, we we, we can achieve uh, the perfection. Mm. Now, there's a rising risk, but also incredible technology, and that is AI. Uh, AI, are, I guess this is a twofold question. Do you see AI potentially be a being a risk where people can use it to try to attack uh, USDT, but also can you use AI to improve the efficiency and your operations and to counter attacks and things along those lines? I think, um, well, I, I think that different ways in which AI could be used to attack not just uh, Tether as a company, but uh, all the companies out there, like okay. there are deep fakes and so on, right? So you can create, a, you know, the, the stupidest uh, things and uh, start to create panic. I mean, sure, you know, the the beauty of it is that, uh, you know, we, as I said, we are paranoid and we are always thinking how we can protect um, the company and our users. In the end, we know that whatever happens, we have the funds, we have the money, right? as it's been said, 
And so we can, we are, we are extremely resilient. Unfortunately, I think AI is not much of a threat to us, mm-hmm. but is, is going to change the, the shape of society. It's going to be, you know, changing so many jobs from marketing, social, um, coding, everything that we know, everything that is digital will change with AI. There are, you know, I don't think there will be regulations to protect this change and or to, you know, slow down this change. It's like, you know, in uh, in the 17, 1700s, trying to prevent the Industrial Revolution because that would optimize the efficiency of production and put many people out of work. Yeah. Right. So there is with this type of changes, societal changes, there is no way to for regulation regulators to to put um, a break to 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 this to this uh, to this revolution. So I think that is one of the reasons why I think there will be a, social, a lot of social unrest in the future because people will find or companies might hire less. Hmm. Just because the efficiency of and the productivity will go much higher, right? So, so there is uh, people should be aware. People should understand AI, understand the potential of AI, right? They should never put their head uh, under the sand, hmm. thinking that their job will never be affected by AI. You are also seeing how you have these companies like Figure AI that produce robots. You have Boston Dynamics, you have Tesla. I mean, robots plus these new AI systems uh, like ChatGPT4 and and, um, Gemini 1.5 are are going to be a game changer. And the investments on on AI will dwarf the investment in crypto and blockchain Mm. by enormous amount. And so we can expect a growth, an incredible growth in, um, in in the pace of, of evolution of AI. As a, t- a tether, we have invested in one of the biggest AI infrastructure providers with the, the highest number of GPUs in Europe called Northern Data. We believe that having access to key infrastructure is going to be part of, of the future and uh, ensuring that companies like us that has the openness ethos at the core is really it is really important that we are part of the game. So, yeah, long story short, I um, think we have to be all a little bit scared and excited about the future of AI. For sure. Now, you mentioned regulations. Uh, we see around the world governments are working on crypto regulations in addition to stablecoin regulations. How is Tether prepared for uh, or preparing for what changes may come in the markets. Obviously, the most important thing is you have the reserves, right? And you, like you guys said, you're very open. You got uh, Cantor Fitzgerald and these different folks who you're working with, um, who can attest to all these things you're doing, your your quarterly attestations. Um, but we don't know what these governments may do. Um, but, but how are you preparing for that? So there are different types of governments. So there are governments that are more um, open to change. Mm -hmm. Let's think about uh, El Salvador or Argentina, right? There there are governments that are ready to embrace this change just because they understand that if they are faster than the others, Mm -hmm. they will gain the most. I think change is gonna be, is always inevitable. I think the naivety, and I'm European, right? So I'm Italian. And I see, unfortunately, Europe being extremely slow. Europe is, is going through a stagnation, is going towards a decline in, in, in different senses. But uh, for sure, on the economical side, Europe is not, is not going in, in its best time. And the future is not bright, in my opinion. And I say with the, my sadness, with the extreme sadness in my heart. But you know, one of the important things in um, 
is, uh, I think, as of today, is being open about these issues. The So what I see from Europe is the fear of the impact of crypto in the already weak, uh, on the already weak euro as a currency. So I expect from um, European regulators to be much more conservative and much more close to the evolution of, uh, of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and stable coins. There are other countries in, in Asia, Middle East, um, South America and Central America that are much more open. Mm -hmm. And those are the countries that will live with the change that, that uh, blockchain and crypto will be bringing to them. And they will benefit the most. In the end, it's like in the early or the beginning of the last century, if imagine a country that that tried to ban cars mm. to make the horse industry you know be living a longer life you know that that decision those regulators in, in at the beginning regulators uh, or uh, try to regulate the car industry forcing cars going extremely slow and have one people walking in front of the car with waving a red flag to warn everyone around, right? But eventually every single regulator had to cave down the enormous potential of the car industry. And so it will be inevitable and uh, it will that could determine the downfall of countries if they will remain um, on the back foot of economic of an economical revolution that is global at this point. Mm. Um, and then with that said, you got the governments creating CBDCs, right? And they're piloting, they're testing these things. How do you see stable coins and CBDCs coexisting? Do you see a conflict or are they complementary to each other? Both of them, um, of each other. I mean, the the interesting fact, and you know, the the thing about stable coins is that I, I spent I spend most of my life thinking about stable coins, right? So I <laughs> I think about all these issues all the time, mm. and uh, one realization that not everyone yet realized is that. Um, if a CBDC is created, the CBDC will only be used in that country. Apart from the US dollar, there are, and by the way, many people in Congress and candidates to the presidential elections already stated they don't want a CBDC. Right. But aside the US, every other country that creates a CBDC, that CBDC will be used inside the country only. The point of a stable coin is that, and let's go back to you know our offering. We we started with USDT, that is now one hundred and thirty billion dollars market cap. After that, I think early two thousand nineteen, we created Euro Tether, mm, right. and Euro Tether is around forty million dollars in market cap. Why? Because the, the thing is that stable coins are digital. So digital money, like a CDBC, CBDC, money is already digital. Right. In Europe, you have people with credit cards and debit cards and bank accounts. In US, the same. So within Europe or US, no one cares about the stable coin. Why should they, should, why should they care? Right. It's like selling ice cream to an Eskimese. Mm. The stable coins are important. That, and uh, actually, the only stable coin, the only fiat stable coin that is important and is used and has a chance is the dollar stable coin. Just because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world, is there the fiat kind, the king of the fiat currencies. And so everyone outside the US wants want the US dollar. If you create a CBDC, will only like Euro CBDC in the digital euro, it will only work in Europe and will just be a replacement you know, with some extra steps of uh, of uh, the current, um, you know, economic and financial rails on Europe. So I, I think is not is not going to 
change much and will not improve the utility of the euro outside of Europe. Because again, we tried. We tried since many years. We succeeded with the dollar. We didn't succeed with the euro just because no one wants the, um, the euro. The only thing that worked much better than the euro and grew quite a lot is tether gold, is half a billion. Is quite still far compared to the US dollar, but it's half a billion dollars. So it's 10 times, more than 10 times bigger than tether euro. Mm -hmm. So this should show that if even if there are CBDCs, people will always resort to use dollars and digital dollars. So that's why I think there will be a existence between CBDCs and, uh, and stable coins like USDT. Um, I know we're coming up on time, so I want to ask you about the Bitcoin ETFs, and then we'll hit the wrap-up questions. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Bitcoin ETF launches? The inflows have been incredible, huge demand for Bitcoin, um, and now Bitcoin can go into people's retirement accounts. There's also talks that London, they want to get a, a Bitcoin ETP going, Hong Kong also exploring this. What are your thoughts on that? Well, definitely is exciting because he's, uh, he's uh, bringing Bitcoin uh, in um, in um, the Premier League mm. of uh, of finance, and everyone out is excited about um, the enormous purchasing power. And myself, I'm super excited about the enormous purchasing power of all the hedge funds that now can they couldn't buy Bitcoin, but now they can buy Bitcoin ETF. So imagine when the pension funds that are enormous, gigantic will only devote a really small portion of their, their fund to, to buy the Bitcoin ETF. And that is great because I think we are still early. So Bitcoin can grow a lot in terms of, um, you know, in the next years, in terms of price. No, of course, no financial advice here. Mm -hmm. But the eventually, maybe not now, but eventually we should be also scared about the other side of, of the medal, right? So if there is panic, there is a lot of pressure <laughs> on, uh, on the sell side that Bitcoin never had at that scale. So it's going to be a great test, but it doesn't change that I'm bullish long term. Yeah, absolutely. I, I am worried too a bit about these ETFs because it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? And then I also believe in self-custody and and the you know yeah. the, like we were talking about sovereignty, right? And uh, being able to be your own bank, but putting it in an ETF wrapper. But I guess it's different strokes for different folks depending on what which part of the world you're in. Uh, maybe you know if you're in a country in Africa, it's you you don't have access to an ETF, but you can self-custody your Bitcoin. But if you're in the United States and you're an older generation, throw it into my retirement account, right? I, I don't know. No. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, now, we got some uh, wrap-up questions here for you. First, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? Probably will be Matrix. So exactly like uh, probably end of 1990s, <laughs> uh, where you know some machine will will tell me how the steak tastes. <laughs> yeah, um, and and I know you're you, you, being you know someone who's into computers and, and coder and so forth from back in the day. That 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 sounds ideal for you. Um, rapid fire questions. Favorite food? Meat. Favorite musician or band? Metallica. Uh, favorite movie. Um, the Godfather classic. Oh yeah, a classic for sure. Favorite book? Um, the Foundation of Asimov. Mm -hmm. When you're not working at Tether Bitfinex, what are you doing for fun? Uh, really, I mean, I'm just training a little bit, but uh, and and skiing when I can. But I'm always working. That that's my passion. Uh, Paolo, absolute pleasure, man. I, I'm so bullish on Tether and what you guys are doing. Uh, I got to have you back on in the future, but uh, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Tony. It was great. I really enjoyed it.